And you've seen this kind of thing happen over the 17 years, have you not? It's just almost a miraculous happening when you see a life transformed, isn't it? It is. And it is easily recognized because jailhouse religion is very true to itself. There's no hypocrisy in a prison. If there is, it is rooted out by those who are the peers of the hypocrite. Oh, I see. You cannot hide from other prisoners if you're a prisoner. There's no way that you can be a sham. They know your life inside and out. They live with you. And to describe the culture, there is no privacy. Consequently, you are known for who you are on the inside. Boy, if that were true in the church today, would that not be a uh, a whole different element of, of conviction, right? There's no doubt. That would be a, a great deal of the contrast, but there's even a deeper contrast here. And probably we need to just go ahead and talk about the yep. justice of God at this point, because it's what makes a man in prison who he is when he becomes a called man of Christ. And that is that he has experienced the justice of God through judgment. You need to place yourself in your mind's eye in one of these men's life. He's been rejected by every single entity and relationship in his life, except maybe his mother. And even then, she's looking at him with a different cockeyedness, if you will. Right. And there is this tremendous shame the sense of disgrace, the sense of abandonment. And all of a sudden, everybody that he's ever loved or ever known is judging him. And then he hears the clang of the iron doors, and he's so alone and so abandoned that he lifts his voice and he turns his eyes toward heaven, and he calls out to whomever will listen, and the Holy Spirit brings to him the name of Jesus, and in that word, he is able to hear the voice of Jesus saying, I will judge you for your sin, but I will also forgive you from it, and I have the power and the authority to pardon your iniquity. Now, there is nobody else who judges him That's right. so thoroughly and yet can forgive him at the same time. That is a monumental issue, is it not? It is huge, and that's the difference between jailhouse religionists, those who are converted within the the context of their crime and the judgment and their betrayal of themselves and the abandonment of society toward them, and then the revelation of Jesus unveiling his person to them and teaching them that he loves them in spite of themselves. When you stand before these students and you teach every one of them, you see you, you see the looks in their eyes. They've all come from different backgrounds, but they've been all judged the same way, correct? And the thing is that that you know that only Jesus Christ can make a difference for them and he can only it's only Jesus who can who can make a mark on their heart and make a mark in their life to change their morality and change their relationship t- to God, correct? Oh, yes. Absolutely. You know, the psalmist says in 142, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. And Jesus says those very words when he calls a man out of himself into the newness of life that being crucified with him brings. There's such a joy here in a culture when you see those who understand true repentance and the holiness of God and his justice. We're not comfortable with judgment, and we're not comfortable with the idea that we are truly the enemy of God until Jesus 
stands in our place and actually is the substitutionary atonement for our sin. We don't get this idea very comfortably that God is our enemy when we are in unbelief, that his justice and holiness demands that we be saved from our sin. Now, when we grasp that, we begin to grasp the cross. And so much of what happened at the cross, I'm afraid our modern pulpits are not telling, and they're not seeing, and they are not recognizing, nor are they calling our people to the visualization of what happened at the cross on behalf of us. And why it happened is because man was and had become God's enemy. And Jesus was the enemy of God because when God put our sin on him, he was the one that had to pay for being the enemy of God. And that's why he gave up his life. He gave it away and became the enemy of God, and sin will kill whomever it touches. And never before the cross had God fully and freely let go his wrath on sin. He had always held it back proportionally to his revelation. But at the cross, he unleashed his full wrath on sin, and he walked away, and Jesus paid the price of that unleashing of his full wrath. If you come into the sphere of God becoming man, the incarnation, you realize that by faith now, Jesus and the Father are agreeing on things. And that Jesus spends his entire 33 years agreeing with the Father, even in Gethsemane, Mm -hmm. and even from the cross. And the whole scripture, Old and New Testament, is about what they are agreeing on. And the New Testament, the New Covenant, is their final agreement. And from the cross, Jesus, as man, proposes that the Father agree with him that death needs to be conquered, and sin needs to be completely forgiven, because it was not being forgiven through the annual temporary IOU of the sacrificial system that God had given Israel. But once and for all, man needed to be pardoned and forgiven. So within this understanding, Jesus is on the cross laying down his life for this purpose agreeing with the Father that man must be punished as the enemy of God. And so he lays his life down as this. The Father leaves him in his wrath toward this enemy. And in the process, the earth goes dark to signify that he's left. And Jesus is totally alone because sin will not be in the presence of a holy God And Jesus speaks out into the abyss of the darkness, and he calls by faith for the solution to the sin issue. And he says, Father, into thy hands I commend unto the thief myself. And that is a statement of faith and a proposal of the new covenant, asking the Father to agree that sin needs to be forgiven once and for all, and that death needs to be conquered. And then he dies. By his own willingness, he gives up his own life, premature to what it would have been had men had their way. That's right. And sin did its job. It took the father three days or he took three days, and he answered on Easter morning, yes, I agree. And so Jesus ascends 
He's crowned King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He gives the Holy Spirit because now he has the God-like characteristic. He's now retrieved all that was divine in him, and it's been multiplied because now he is the judge of the entire universe, according to John 5, 23 and following. And he is King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. He's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He's all of those things in the coronation. He is the Holy Spirit, and he calls the church unto himself. What is the church to do? The church is to learn to agree with what the Father and the Son continuously, eternally are agreeing on. That's our job. That's what we are about. We are to, by faith, find out what they are agreeing on and align ourselves with that.